Welcome to A Little Waywards, a podcast coming out of St. Therese Institute, where we do little very well. <laughs> My name is Nick. And I'm Jim. And uh, yeah, I, we're just uh, going to be talking about some various topics that uh, we feel like uh, would, be, would be neat to talk about from our hearts. Blah! Talk about wordiness. Yeah, well, uh, we had a couple of different ideas thrown on the table for this, and there's a little bit of going one direction, a little bit of going the other direction, and that all kind of just... <laughs> went up. We yeah, a whole yeah. Different one on the table now. I feel like uh, we've all, we've been like a tea kettle and we've been boiling off all of the steam or something like that. And I think we've got some sediment at the bottom. That's not an attractive image sludge. at all. Some sludge. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to share the sludge with you. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The dregs, you know. Um, yeah, but but first, before we get going, how have you been, Jim? How's uh, how's been your weekend and last week or so? Yeah, doing all right. You know, in this time of um, well, I think it was. Somewhat the conversation we were having earlier today. Mm. Um, uh, this time of, of seclusion, uh, isolation, uncertainty, uh, it wears after a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I find for myself, one of the things that's been really wearing is that sense of, of um, not seeing a clear way forward. Um, mm. you know, as, and and it's, it's difficult as much as we talk about uh, doing the due to the moment and, and uh, staying grounded in that. And, Trusting God and keeping move forward. And those are all things that I absolutely espouse. It's hard. It's tough. And sometimes, you know, a little bit of anxiety creeps up. I know myself. Uh, I've shared that with you the last, uh, last few weeks. Uh, it's an old bugaboo of anxiety. It kind of creeps up now and again. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, that's totally relatable, Jim. Um, yeah, it's the weird thing is that in the middle of all of this um, COVID-19 self-isolation stuff happening, um, there's just a lot of like, as you say, anxious thoughts. And um, here at St. Therese, we're trying out 17 different things that we don't normally do to try and keep the, the formation program running and rolling. Yeah. And um, oftentimes it feels like we're just kind of casting these things out into the void, yeah. you know. That's yeah, the, that's, I, used the, I used the image at one point of like being an artillery gunner. <laughs> you know, we're just kind of like poof, lobbing shells into the... And you're, and you're listening for the echo or the resounding or just, thud. There's, Hopefully there's going to be some, you know, some uh, radio operator out there saying, all right, two degrees up, three degrees to the left, you know, fire. So, <laughs> but it is kind of lobbing shells into the dark or. Or into the void. Into you know. the void. Mine's yeah. almost like more the image of space. You know, like you just cast out your garbage or, well, you think it's, you don't even know if it's garbage. You just don't even know what you're lobbing out. And um, it just, all of a sudden, it's just gone and you don't know where it went. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think that's kind of getting into a bit of the topic for today, really. Um, just our, our lived experience of the last couple of weeks and kind of just unpacking it as a Christian in this time period. Uh, last month. Yeah, the it's last month. A couple of weeks know. times two and a half now. A couple of weeks times two and a half. So the topic title for today is podcast into the deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pod. I, I, I think that's what pod stands for, doesn't it? You know, put out into the deep. Casting. Casting your nuts. <laughs> yeah, podcast. Yeah, sure does feel like that. Um, it's funny because you know I mentioned mentioned struggling with uh, struggling with a little bit of anxiety about uh, about life in general, but yeah, with this podcast too, uh, particularly this has been a this has been a point for me, which has been kind of strange. Uh, talking is not usually a problem for me. Getting me to shut up, that can be a, mm -hmm. be a trick. Well, one thing that uh, you, you and I are known for, Jim, is being a so bit quickly. verbose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I realize how often that I need to remind myself of these core teachings that, you know, that we do espouse in the little way that I teach. Um, so I find myself uh, walking with my rosary, often evangelizing myself, you know, mm -hmm. reminding myself of these truths, too. Uh, but this one's been a difficult one, the, the podcast. Um, how have you been finding the, uh, the experience? Um, difficult for, I think, possibly some different reasons. Um, one common thing we had in conversation earlier was just trying to figure out where we're going in this program and trying to figure out the content we're putting out um, is really, um, it comes down to, I think, questions of charism as well. Mm. Like for myself, um, you know, a charism in general is uh, just like this grace that's given by the Holy Spirit to a particular person in the church to serve the body in some way. Um, so for myself, I think charism of teaching is one that's there. I don't think I could have survived two years of teaching, having never done it before without a charism of teaching. You know, the Holy Spirit definitely helps out when you need mm -hmm. it. And then for me, a charism of knowledge is one that kind of has presented itself to and fro. So, so in terms of doing the podcast, 
How, do you, how would you define a, a charism of knowledge? What do you mean by that? Well, that's one of my little question marks for myself, too. I'm, just, I'm still discerning that charism. But, um, for example, whenever I sit down and, you know, read the Bible or break out a book of theology or philosophy, I've got a bit of a philosophy bug, um, you know, or rather the bugs got me. I'm not sure which. Hmm. But, uh, you know, whenever I read it and I just encounter the truth, there's something exciting in it. And there's something like dynamic and I see it's important and I see uh, a need to talk about it in mm. some way. And I, it, it, actually one of the things that I find too is that it almost becomes an end for itself to kind of just pursue. You know, now one time I had a whole bunch of uh, romantic notions of, you know, being a philosopher or something like that. And frankly, a lot of those drifts drop to the side because, uh, you know, when you're in family life, um, <laughs> you know, uh, having to deal with your little kid crying and with colic at 3 a.m. And when you're trying to be a philosopher with uninterrupted reading and <laughs> contemplation, um, you realize that, it, you know, you have to adjust a bit. But the main thing with the charism of knowledge, I think, is just um, this enthusiasm and this ability granted by the Holy Spirit to look into the truth. Mm and try and communicate in a way that gives life to the body um, mm. and brings, brings people into that enthusiasm, which I, I think is there in some small measure. Yeah. So when I look at this podcast, I don't have so much an issue in terms of like how we um, are, like whether we're putting it out or not. I think it's worthwhile to do. It just comes down to um, balancing this out with, um, well, with yourself who have different charisms in play and then also trying to adjust it to the charism and mission of St. Therese oh, Institute. St. Therese is an institute. You know? Yeah, I think that's important. It's interesting you raise that because I think that's been a bit of a, a point of clar clarity for me too. Um, you know, I do wrestle with, with preparing these things, a community teaching, you know, I'll do those on the Monday mornings and I come in, you know, pretty much shooting off the, shooting from the hip or shooting from the heart mm -hmm. on those ones. And I, you know, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world because it's talking to James's cell phone rather than <laughs> talking to a group in the chapel. And yet that's something that flows more naturally for me. Um, I find this much more difficult. It's been funny because it's been a bit of a coconut. I've been turning over trying to crack it open and figure out what's going on. But I think charisms is what I actually clarified. I realize, you know, charisms that I recognize in the work that I do are of encouragement, of pastoring. Um, and those are key ones. Uh, and, and in the context of... of formation is through accompaniment mm. but that's very much face to face one on one mm. um, now i can manage that on a zoom meeting or on a phone call but uh, this podcasting out into the deep you know a pre-recorded <laughs> not sure what the felt need is or where it's going or yeah so i could see how for a charism of knowledge this is a beautiful vehicle for that is just sharing what you've, what mm -hmm. you've learned well, I would say that this is very comfortable for me in terms of just like this idea of sitting down and talking about ideas because I just, I consider that fun, you mm -hmm. know, like I, I kind of see it as something that would be just kind of easy to step into and easy to step out of. Um, I don't think I have a, a charism of pastoring. So it's funny because throughout the context of the year, sometimes um, at St. Therese, which is an obvious pastoring kind of charism mm -hmm. operating here to the individual community in this place. Sometimes you'll go ahead and do something, Jim, um, which makes sense to you completely, 100%. I can see you on fire, your zeal, and I get carried into that, but I would not have thought of doing that on my mm. own, you know. So like walking into, for example, a high-low session where it's like a pulse check on the community. Everyone shares with what they're doing. You know, like sometimes I step into those and it's just like there's no zeal. I don't really see the point. And then it's in the middle of it when I see your charism working and mm. I see the students actually opening up. Then I see stuff happening. Mm. But that kind of thing doesn't usually um, appeal to me just on an effective level. Like intellectually, I can kind of create a reason for it, but it's just not the same thing, you know? Yeah. So maybe something similar going yeah. on here. Yeah, well, thank you for reflecting that. And certainly I see your enthusiasm. Uh, in the preparation for these uh, 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 <laughs> podcasts, <laughs> these mission thing, quest, whatever that, yeah, quest these thing, things, yeah, quest thing, um, and your enthusiasm, your ability to do it on on the fly. So, well, praise God. Maybe that's uh, the Lord sending uh, disciples out two by two, and we're in this, <laughs> so we can lean on each other's charism. So, well, for me, I'm I'm doing this as a matter of uh, coming back to these core teachings. I'm doing this as a matter of duty of the moment. Uh, it's been what's requested, and so I'm willing to offer what I have, my, my few crummy, moldy loaves <laughs> and, and a couple of smelly fish, um, and let God work the miracle. But 
praise God if you can dress those up a little bit with your charisms before they go through the Lord. <laughs> <to> the Lord. <laughs> That's nice. Maybe you're, uh, uh, maybe you're an Andrew. Um, Andrew, who was on, who, in that story, in the, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, it was Andrew who mm. presented the young man and his, and his offering uh, to the Lord. Mm, and I think maybe. there's something about that uh, apostleship. Maybe that's part of the charisms too. Uh, well, and that, that brings up an interesting question. You, you said um, they send them out two by two, you know. Um, on one level, you can kind of see why. Like uh, on a very human level, you can see like, oh, so apostles get lonely. They need someone for encouragement. They need someone to, you know, bolster them when they're being weak um, or like to correct them when they're being too obtrusive. But I also wonder if there's just this charismatic element there, you know, as well, where like you send out two by two and there are these, um, these particular gifts the Holy Spirit has given. And sometimes these gifts seem to be in conflict, you know. Um, well, certainly the teaching of charisms recognizes that there are charisms that individuals have, but also charisms that are group charisms. Uh, there's going to be a dynamic that happens when two or three are gathered. I think there's another obvious reason why the disciples are sent two by two. If the Lord's very clear in saying that by this they will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Well, it's hard to love one another if you don't have another there to love. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that it may be a part of it. Part of that witness is the communion of persons that we're called to. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one thing I just thought of for this podcast, maybe it would be simpler for both of us. If we did what that Italian priest did in Italy um, with the congregation in the pews. Oh, just COVID taped up pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just taped up pictures <laughs> on all the pews. Uh, um, and he's just like, he said to his congregation, you know, um, I need your photos when I celebrate mass. I, I just can't do it. You know, I mean, think of it. I, I wonder if that priest actually has a charism of pastoring. He needs to have this sense of this active community. So... You know, so Could to be. all those students of St. Therese, please pass pictures, in your yeah. photos <laughs> and we'll pepper them all yeah. over the stage. Well, yeah. certainly one of the things that I've, I've found is that this whole time um, with, the, with the crisis that has come up and the shifts that have happened, uh, it's certainly been pushing me to the edge of my comfort zone. And I think this is probably one of these times when we talk about a thin place sometimes, you know, that place with a veil between heaven and earth. Well, this is a thin place between my comfort and my lack of comfort. <laughs> and I think this is one of these things that pushes me, which is good. And I would imagine that um, all of our students um, would be very happy to hear that I'm being pushed to those existential peripheries, <laughs> uh, the edge of the comfort zone where the growth and grace is happening. So I'm very grateful for, for your enthusiasm, Nick, on this. And yeah, that, no, uh, I, sustains. So thank you. No, I, I'm, you're welcome. And the other thing too is that I've also just got a bit of youthful cockery. I think you know, just like, uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> I just, I, you better I kinda, coin that phrase. Yeah, youthful, <laughs> youthful. Um, I don't know. You get a little brash, and you just throw yourself into something that you think is cool. I love mm -hmm. podcasts. Um, I think podcasts are really neat. But one of the things that I found with them is, um, I was just saying this earlier, was uh, podcasts tend to be a little more atomistic. Um, in terms of like there are these, they are each individual like little sound bites of various topics. You can listen to one. Atomistic, like an atom. Like an atom, okay. you know, like, like this tiny little fragment. And you can kind of consider each on its own. What um, you and, and I to an extent now are very used to doing is building this entire program that's built upon one section after another of like this deep progression and congruence and stuff. And the nature of a podcast from what I'm seeing is not quite the same thing. So there's a bunch of like unknowns and uncertainties and mm. I've experienced those too. Um, I've got to be real there. Like this whole thing of casting out into the void. I just, mm -hmm. it's, it's there even, even as we're speaking, you know. So as you're chatting here, Nick, I'm thinking, so it's the a formation program is more like a pilgrimage mm. and a podcast is more like, what time is it, Mr. Wolf? <laughs> oh, is gosh. that kind of where you're going? <laughs> oh, let me no, think of another not. one. Um, it's more like going and shopping for vitamins or oh, something okay. like that, yeah. maybe. Um, it's a little more of a consumer image, I suppose. Each step of a t at a time. Yeah, well, I honestly have, uh, I cannot say that I've ever listened to any podcasts. Mm. So this is a, a medium that is um, quite foreign to me, which might also account for some of the, some of the challenge, so... It is what it is. A little wayward. <laughs> a little wayward with Jim and Nick. Yeah. This yeah. has been. I'm just kidding. So what do you think of the notion then of uh, how do you feel about the idea of things being cast out into the deep? Uh, and particularly in this time because it is very, very different than uh, the classroom when you have 
uh, your students that you're able to actually read and, and uh, respond to the gesture, to the expression, to the questions. Uh, it's very different from a, you know, a community meeting in chapel or, or table conversation where you are engaged. This is, uh, this is very much, uh, the image comes to mind, it's the sower and the seed. You're just throwing the seed, not really even responsible for where it's landing, just responsible for the throwing, which is uncomfortable. Yeah, it is very uncomfortable because um, all of us, uh, we all want to see some elements of success. Um, we all have, I, I think really for me, one of the things that's kind of come to the forefront is a question of identity. Um, where is my identity kind of taking place in this? And, you know, um, it's not to say that for myself, I've seen too much of an attachment to seeing the product. But I think what's kind of happened for me um, in the middle of casting out into the deep and throwing the seed out is just a bit of detachment um, and a little bit of just, well, I think anxiety and with that, the, the, uh, the, promise, or the opportunity for trust in the Lord, that if we are being attentive to this duty, um, you know, which uh, those above us have asked us to keep going with, mm -hmm. um, that the Lord is going to make that fruitful one way or another. I remember talking to my father-in-law one time, and he said, uh, he, he, he does talks from time to time, and there was something he said that always struck me, which was um, in the beginning of when he started giving talks and, and going for speaking routes and such, sometimes he'd only get like 10 people coming to a talk, even, and 10 people in a church, you know, like this 300, uh, 300 uh, capacity church. And there would be only one of these 10 people that would come up to him afterwards and sort of say, you know, oh, thank you, that really actually moved me. Um, that I think I'm going to go back to confession or something like that. Go back to communion, you know. And um, he learned very early on that just doing it for the sake of one soul mm. or one person, like if that was all that came out of it, um, he had to be content with that because he was facing... Uh, just um, a, almost a slightly similar situation here. So I've been clinging to that, um, realizing that if there's just one person listening who's, you know, uh, getting something out of it, whatever it might be, <laughs> why would they listen to us? You know, mm -hmm. um, that might be worthwhile. Another one, too, that's been in my mind on repeat almost for the last three or four weeks has been... Um, uh, I think it's Jenea Trudell, right? Just make the gift. Just make the gift. Just make the gift, yeah. Yeah, and that's been, I think that's pretty powerful because if you actually look at the scriptures, whenever there's something that someone wants from the Lord, uh, for example, I'm thinking most particularly of Abraham looking for healing for his wife Sarah so they can conceive a child, one of their mm. biggest question marks. Um, they didn't receive healing until Abraham went out and made the gift of healing to someone else, mm. you know, there was this, um, there was this moment where he prayed for God's intercession over, um, I forget the names, but like the, uh, the wife, the wife of, I think it was, uh, ah, this other clansman. And then it was after that, that suddenly Sarah was able to conceive. Um, mm, speaks powerfully about that mystery of kenosis and pleurosis. There has to be that kenosis, that self emptying, mm -hmm. uh, before there can be the uh, the filling. It's like we, we, can't, uh, we can't be a vessel to hold what God has to, to offer through us until we are empty of ourselves. So it's a stripping away the detachment you were speaking of. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, no, that's 100% that's what it is. And it's what John Paul II called the law of the gift. Mm -hmm. You know, um, We talk a lot about that in the way of beauty class. W we talk about it a lot in this program. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everywhere, like sometimes the students get sick of it because they just, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're saying something and then one person pipes up saying, wait, that sounds like Gaudium et Spes 22. 22. And then that yeah. one sounds like Gaudium et Spes 24. If you don't know those paragraphs, look them up. They're awesome and worth a lot of contemplation. Or ask a student from St. Therese. Oh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> or John Paul II. Or John Paul II. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the basic, uh, the basic law of the gift is, um, you know, we only grow to the measure that we give away, in a sense. Um, and if we give ourselves completely to Christ, then we receive ourselves completely to Christ, uh, completely from Christ. It's one of the weirdest things about the faith. It's a very paradoxical, but mm. it's one of these paradoxes that gives life, mm. you know. So for me, that's, that's been another truth that I've just been kind of holding on to as we do this podcast, as I do my Sunday gospel reflections coming out of St. Therese. Mm -hmm. If you haven't checked those out, uh, I advise anyone to maybe take a look 
or not. I'm still not well, sure about as them. As do I. I think they're very good. You oh. do a beautiful job with those, Nick. Well, thank you. Yeah. This is just turning into a giant Nick Pep session, isn't it? There you are. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that this kind of thing that we're experiencing, Jim, is perhaps a little more universal um, in, this time, in this time period, eh? Mm. Like, I wonder how many other people are kind of going through this sense of aimlessness. And Well, certainly, you know, in light of what we've been speaking about over the past few weeks, you know, uh, my reflections on Nazareth and our talking about Nazareth, this is really the heart of it. And this is just me, in this instance, wrestling with these teachings and struggling with, with uh, incarnating uh, the word in, the, in this way. Um, but it really is a matter of, of doing the due to the moment, of entering into the now, of trusting God's providence, certainly in a time when it's hard to see the next step forward. Uh, I was chatting with uh, somebody just yesterday um, using the image of it's gotten awful misty. It's like walking through a fog and you can barely see where the next foot needs to go. Um, and that's a scary thing. That's a frightening thing. It's for anybody, it's a frightening thing to not be able to see things see things clearly. Um, but there's the great opportunity for, for trust. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and um, what, in, uh, what are some things you think that can kind can, can of guys go sideways whenever you're, in the middle of misty, misty waters. Like, what would you regularly tell a student when they're going through a yeah, misty time? Funny you know? that you mention that. What would I tell a student? Because often that's the kind of coaching I have to offer myself when I'm out walking across the prairies on uh, praying my rosary <laughs> and give myself a talking to. It's like, Jim, if you were a student walking into your office, troubling with uh, having this trouble and this concern about this, what would you tell yourself? So yeah, that that self uh, self care in that way. Um, it's funny, what's actually coming to mind in this moment right now is uh, something that happened to me hmm. when, I was, uh, when I was at university in uh, Gaming, Austria. It's the study abroad program with Franciscan University. So we're in Austria. And um, I don't know, I just had an overwhelming need to go for a hike on my own. I just need to hmm. blow off a stink or something. So, yeah. uh, so I decided to go for this hike. Did not tell anybody where I was going, which is a foolish thing to do when you're in the foothills of the Alps, mm. going on a hike in a country where you don't speak the language. Anyway, um, uh, went up the, the hill behind where we were staying and um, just pushed it and clambered up uh, what, had, what was a dried creek bed and got up to the ridge. And was walking along and, and saw that it was pretty clear oriented, knew where I was because there was a steep fall of land to the left, which led down to the town of Gaming. And the other side of the hill was this nice gentle slope into rolling and you could see farmland and whatnot. So I knew that that was hmm, the, other, the other side of the hill. It was very beautiful. And so I thought as long as I'm walking along the ridge and I've got the you know, gentle slope off to the farmland on one side, that's not home. And the more rugged fall of land uh, that's that's the way back down to Gami. And so I pushed along the uh, pushed along the bush up along the ridge. Um, got startled by a by a deer uh, <laughs> that I startled as well. So both of our hearts pounding. Um, uh, got to a place where it was lot you know lots of lots of uh, um, scrub brush and undergrowth. So I wasn't able to see clearly. So I climbed up onto a stump or a log to get a view of things and looked out towards Gaming and saw this long, gentle slope of land going in, into farmland, <laughs> which, which immediately had me completely turned around hmm. uh, because that was not what I was looking to see. And I realized that I'd gotten myself disoriented. And it was in that moment, in that time of disorientation uh, and not being able to see clearly where to go next, surrounded by brush, probably the heart still pounding a little bit from the spook of the deer, mm -hmm. thinking it was a bear. The mist of adrenaline what? in your veins. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that little bit. I realized the instinct was to, was to run, mm. um, to try and, and gain some, some sense of, of purpose, control, whatever. Um, but I caught myself in that moment and realized that that would be the exact worst thing to do, because if you're already lost, running into the mist, running into the undergrowth, running into the into the bush. There wasn't misty there, but I'm just by way of comparison. Yeah, yeah, we're our, using our that metaphor pretty, now, pretty, yeah. pretty strongly and loosely. Um, yeah, then I think that's probably what the, the key thing is in this time of feeling perhaps out of control, uh, to learn to be okay with being out of control, 
rather than giving into the anxiety that that will naturally bring up. And I, I think that's what we talk, talk about all the time. It's just a matter of us living it more deeply ourselves. Feel your feelings and choose your attitudes. Mm -hmm. um, when John Paul II uh, was saying, be not afraid, I don't think he was saying, don't feel fear. That would make us not human. You know, we, there's, there's natural fear and there's understandable fear and there's the feeling of fear. But do not allow fear to become your identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think for myself, as I... I've wrestled with a little bit of anxiety over these days and that sense of kind of walking through the, the bush, maybe feeling that, that sense of that same urgency of panic of needing to do something, even if it's just running, which is going to make matters worse. Just stand still. Hmm. Um, and that's an inner stillness too. Be still, be still, and know that I am God. So I think there's a, the opportunity in these days uh, to be still mm -hmm. and, uh, and focus and grounding yourself in the moment and doing the due to the moment. I know that that's been a very, very great blessing for me. Um, I think I was sharing that with you just today at the coffee pot. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the sense that there is only one of me. I can only really do one thing at a time. What is it that I'm supposed to be doing now? And then ground myself in that moment and encounter God and love in that moment. And that sometimes helps to push the mist back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Or at least it doesn't seem to crowd quite so, quite so much. <laughs> Yeah, the duty of the moment almost has this big uh, hair dryer, you know. Uh, okay, sorry, the, uh, the analogies are falling through, <laughs> but yeah. that's okay. But then maybe we come back to what you're saying with the, with the podcast being this kind of atomized thing. So maybe there's something about these, uh, not atomized, what were you saying? Atomist, at, uh, atomic or atom atomistic, I, uh, I forget. These things like an atom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rewind these the podcast, are, please. Yeah. We need to hear that part again. Atomistic, like an atom. Like an atom. Okay. But just the sense of these are each individual things. It's not necessarily a part of a great big whole. And maybe there's something very beautiful and elemental about that, uh, that duty of the moment. Like, it's like well, this an is image this is just... podcast, this conversation, this is where we are and we're focused here. Well, well yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Actually, the image that just came to mind, if we're talking the sower and the seed, I think what we've been doing is almost this notion of... Um, trying to figure out the exact parameters of the garden so then we can just throw this handful of seeds out. I'm just wondering if each and not podcast... not waste any seed. And not waste any seed. I'm wondering if each of these podcasts is just us preparing a seed and just putting it in the bag. One little seed. One yeah, little seed at a time. And then you just throw them out and um, it's not your concern where they go, but our task is to make sure the seeds get in the bag. Mm. Um, maybe that's what we should be focusing on. Mm. Um, so what's been a lifeline for you, Nick, in this time? Oh, gosh. Um... I, other than the regular things like my vocation, my wife, my, my family, um, spiritual director, people I respect around me, um, yourself, Jim, just uh, having conversations. I've just been finding um, lots of prayer has been really good, mm. but at the same time, not too much, um, which is the weirdest thing. I've been realizing in myself that in this, in this time period of COVID-19, um, there is, with all of the uncertainties kind of coming up, you want to fix it. Um, and we all as human beings want security. You know, we want basic stability. We want things, you know, as much as some of us would like the encounter, like new experiences and, you know, we like a little bit of chaos in our lives from time to time because there's a, you know, what the Italians say, the spice of life, I suppose, you know, mm. like this little un bit of unpredictability. The vast, like all human beings want some form of stability. So recognizing with myself that there's this, there's this desire for it, um, and my regular avenues of stability are taken away. Um, first of all, just even recognizing that is big. Because if I don't recognize that, then I'm just going to be walking with a, a wounded leg, and I just don't even realize that it's a wounded leg, and it's going to mm. get worse. You know. So even just taking that moment of self-reflection has been helpful. But one thing that I've been finding is um, with anxiety, I tend to fill my time with anxiety. I tend to try and either sedate it with film or sedate it with board games if I'm not careful. Board games are not so much of an issue. But um, I tend to try and sedate it with work. Mm. You know, One of my bigger anxieties is if I'm feeling purposeless, I want to go and grab a book, and I want to just study, and then I'll have something to bring to St. Therese uh, and like present in a podcast, and I'll know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Yes! Wait a second. Stability. There's yeah. a security going on there. Yeah. So for me, um, I've been going out for long walks. Mm. Um, and there's something since our podcast on leisure that we did, um, I've actually been really, I was really challenged by that podcast 
because even though I believed what I was saying, I looked at my life and I'm like, you know, my life isn't very leisurely. There's not very much celebration of reality going mm. on here. Mm. And what that means is not so much like this, um, you know, uh, celebration of reality is really just letting reality be what it is and beholding it and thanking it almost for mm. what it is. So one thing that I've been doing that has been really saving mental energy has just been on my walks. I go walking around Bruno, this tiny little town in Saskatchewan where we're situated, and all of a sudden I see a tree. And I'm like, when was the last time I actually looked at a tree? Not just observed a tree, which is rather you know, nitpicky, like what color is the tree? What color is that gr l grass? You know, what are the sizes? Like those are very mathematical questions. But leisure is all about just beholding it, allowing yourself to wonder at the tree, mm. you know? And so, you know, even watching my little daughter the other day, you know, walking through a puddle and she was just stepping in a certain way in the puddle. And I'm like, I used to do that when I was like four years old. And then I realized I haven't done that since I was probably nine, you know? Mm. And what's, and so then of course I did the thing where I stepped my foot in the puddle like that. And I was just like, well, that was stupid. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, it's almost like these films where, you know, someone goes through a bit of a nervous breakdown or depression and they, the way they get out of it is simply by these tiny little childlike acts. Yeah. And maybe that's being present to the moment again, present to what is around you in the surroundings. I think that presence is key when you were speaking about um, uh, f filling around the anxiety with things. It's so often we can turn to things in distraction. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how the same activity can either be a distraction, which is pulling you out of the moment, or usually avoiding the moment, um, or the very same activity in a different context with a different heart space it actually is a form of leisure mm -hmm. uh, contemplation. You know, how often do you go for a walk for the sake of just going for a walk because you've got to get it done, get your exercise, but actually going to the walk to, to make it a form of contemplation, speaking that, that wonder. That notion of distraction has been key for me as we've been reflecting on our conversations the last while. Mm -hmm. and it was uh, T.S. Eliot, I think, that said, you know, we're distracted from distraction by distraction. Uh, that makes for a very busy and, you know, quite frankly, anxious life mm -hmm. until we come back to the main thing. And yes. in that. So if ever I'm out walking and I see you either jumping in a puddle or staring you know, with deep intent at a tree, um, I will realize, no, you're not cracked. Well, you can, you, if I'm making an ode or a sonnet to the tree, then I'm cracked. Behold, <laughs> Behold the tree. How bountiful thy branches. Either that or you've seriously slipped in your Catholicism and you're back to Druidism. Twig, you are powerful and uh, twig like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> worshiping the tree? No, yeah, not exactly. gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, that age old question are they worshiping the tree or are they, anyways? Yeah. No. yeah, that's fun. Cool. No, so I think that it really, this whole question of childlikeness and wonder and um, casting out into the deep, this has really been a bit of a jumble of a podcast, but yeah. I think that this has been good. Um, well, over the weekend, it's funny because you're talking about childlikeness and little, that just as a, as a thought, that was one of the little turning points for me um, just this past weekend was, uh, was feeling, was saying I'm feeling empty. I was chatting with somebody and just saying I was feeling empty. And all of a sudden I realized, no, I'm not feeling empty. I'm just feeling little. Mm. And as soon as I was able to realize that, I thought, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's good to feel little. Mm -hmm. So... It's yeah, important. no, it's just, it's just, it's pretty, it's very beautiful. Like when you reflect on St. Therese and, mm -hmm. you know, it's precisely her littleness, her childlikeness that allows her to open her arms to God and allow God to scoop her up into his arms. Mm -hmm. That was her image. And I think that there's so many times um, in our lives when we are faced with anxiety that we want to muscle through it. Mm. As much as I'm respectful of, uh, say, a muscular Catholicism, where it's all about, like, our tradition is strong, our, our thought is strong, and stuff like that, there is a temptation, and it's a very real one, in the middle of that, to overfocus on the strength. Mm. Um, and it's not usually God's strength, it's our strength yes. that we overfocus on. Yeah. Muscular Catholicism, properly understood, is based on God's strength and our littleness, is my argument. And it's interesting, because that's the life of virtue. Yes. And the word virtue that actually comes from the Latin word for strength, for muscle, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. I think. Don't quote me on that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to yeah. correct you yet either. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
So, so speaking of diversions and distractions, or perhaps the due to the moment and leisure, depending on how the, the approach is, um, we had watched a movie. That we did. That yeah. movie was um, the uh, the hundred foot, foot journey. journey. What do you think of that one? Oh my gosh, I love that film. I think I've seen it about four or five times, and it just doesn't get old. And I also get so hungry <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of it. But it's a beautiful little film. And just to summarize a little bit of what it's about, um, basically there's, I think I did this last podcast, but I'll do it again. Um, it's, in a, it's an Indian family that moves from India into France, and they start a little restaurant, um, Indian restaurant, right across from a Michelin star French cuisine restaurant. And suffice to say, uh, the French have a very strong food culture, um, some slight snobbery in there too, dare I say. Sorry, any French listeners, um, but I'm sure you'll agree with me. And, um, and so then it's all about like this dynamic going back and forth between this particularly, the owner of the Michelin star hot a hotel restaurant, the one of the head cooks there, and then this particular young man in the Indian restaurant who has got maybe even a charism of cooking mm -hmm. or something like that. He has a very deep, intimate knowledge of food and he connects it to such things as memory, uh, the question of human meaning, and it's yeah. just a beautiful, well-told little story mm. produced by uh, Steven Spielberg and Oprah Winfrey, of all people. Go figure. Yeah. Uh, the charism of cooking is actually a charism of craftsmanship. I think that's where it's there grouped under. It's creating beautiful things for, for people. Um, I was really struck by the movie, uh, watching it again, uh, particularly in light of the reading of Christus Vivid, uh, Christ is Alive, uh, John, or not John Paul II, Pope Francis's letter to, uh, to young people. And uh, uh, in the chapters that we've been reflecting on, he speaks about the need for deep roots and a rootedness mm. in, in cultures. And there can be a temptation of young people to distance themselves from, from tradition and uh, from, their, from their past, where they come from. And there's an interesting tension because you've got this apparent, uh, uh, very, very, not apparent, but very real clash of culture. But there's also a generational thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, the main character is very deeply rooted to his past and yet with the youthful desire to explore new horizons and open up new, uh, new avenues and uh, make a way for himself, which in a sense is, is moving away from what was tradition. And yet there's this beautiful moment of nostalgia, uh, mm. that, that longing and that yearning for home that happens uh, in the context of where the main character is away from home. And it really does bring him, in a sense, back to himself and back to his rootedness. And so I thought it was a beautiful embodiment of what the Holy Father is actually speaking to young people. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful film. Um, great film if you're a foodie. <laughs> um, Which I think we both are. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think so. And uh, um, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested in knowing what uh, some of the folks that might be watching this podcast, what, uh, what are their favorite foodie films? Uh, mm -hmm. I know there's a few that I've, uh, a few that I've seen. Uh, no Reservations, that's a fun kind of romantic comedy yeah, foodie nice film. Yeah, nice rom-com. Um, another one that I saw recently that uh, uh, actually enjoyed was on Netflix. The language is a little bit rough here and there, but uh, the, the theme was beautiful, and it's a new film uh, called Chef. Hmm. Um, and uh, again, about dreams and desires and a truncation of life, but also the fulfillment of these things. So mm -hmm. a good foodie movie. But these movies all make, make you hungry. <laughs> They do, definitely. And so uh, I think Christian actually put up a recipe for butter chicken online, mm -hmm. um, which was very appreciated, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it, there's something just about food film, food films in general. And you know, like on one level, it could be just as deep as the stomach. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I actually think there's something more yeah. to it. Um, I, I, like I have actually a book, a philosophy book on my shelf called um, The Hungry Soul. It's by a, a Jewish... Uh, uh, doctor named Leon Cass. Mm. And I kind of just cracked it open a little bit just because I knew we were going to have this discussion. And he said, you know, paraphrased, it's like, there is great significance to the fact that we are eating creatures. Mm. And I'm just like, I just, uh, I haven't read any further in the book, but I just pause in that line. I'm just like, what does it mean to say that we're eating creatures? You know, that we are creatures that are hungry, you know? <laughs> And he says that, you know, with human beings, obviously we have a soul and so, and like a rational soul, however you want to say it. And then that way we're above the animal world, but we're also partaking in it, in this mm. weird, interesting dialogue, you know, and we bring in our higher elements and engage them in with our, if you will, lower elements, mm -hmm. not, not in terms of being unsignificant, but in terms of just like order of being, you know, and I think that, um, 
there's something really amazing when you look at these food films because they all touch on this. Mm -hmm. These cultures of food that kind of just swirl in there. You see these amazing focused loci or like these focused centers of human creativity and human ingenuity. The reflections of the Imago Dei, like this creative impulse that God created the world with. We're made in his image and likeness. We have this too and food is one of those areas. Mm. And it's not just simply about filling your stomach. No. Um, no. It's, this, it's, it's a culture and family and uh, communion. Mm. Uh, it's for not, not for no reason that Holy Communion is called Holy Communion. Yeah, and, and the amount of for images of the soul. feast in Scripture and yeah. bountiful amounts of wine and the yeah. wedding of Cana. Yeah. Like it's a bountiful religion, you know. The wedding banquet of the Lamb. <laughs> exactly. Good. Well, I'd like to suggest a movie. I'm just going to throw one out there in, in the themes of foodie films and, and in the context of this communion and this idea of communion, uh, certainly we, we, uh, we would see how this resonates deeply with the, the themes of theology of the body too, that we are body, soul entities. Um, and that's a, this is an older film. It's a little bit, uh, maybe a little more difficult to, to track down. But if you're looking for a film that has some really solid Catholic, uh, deep way of beauty type themes in it, uh, that's really carrying forward just what we were talking about, the power of of food uh, and how we can approach it in an integrated way. That would be the film Babette's Feast. Mm -hmm. uh, Babette's Feast. So it came out in the 80s. It's a, uh, it's a Danish film, so it's not in English. It has English subtitles. Um, it's, it, it'd be a little bit of work to find it, also a little bit of work to watch it. Uh, it's mm. not high action. And um, uh, unlike 100 Foot Journey, which is lots of you know, interesting story and plot and color, uh, this whole film is a little bit more drab, but it is worth the effort. Mm. Um, uh, a little bit like shucking oysters. <laughs> I was worth just thinking of cracking open a walnut. Or like cracking that. open a walnut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the, the grace of the effort of entering into the, uh, into the film is you realize that there are these themes of, uh, of communion, of Eucharist, uh, the tensions that we experience in, in our own hearts as human beings between uh, between the body and the soul, and do we err on the side of, uh, of the spiritual being more important, so uh, angelism, or do we err on the side of the body being more important, and that's the, uh, uh, the, the addict uh, mm -hmm. type, you know, type notion. The Christopher West talked about addict and stoic and, and that tension between, but actually coming to that, that balanced contemplative focus of the mystic, and there's a deep mysticism in this, uh, in this film. Mm -hmm. and uh, the community of the saints being recognized and, and having to have one who knows to be able to articulate the language and recognize the graces and draw others into receiving the graces. It's an interesting film. It's worth a watch. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing and, it. I haven't seen the, it yet. So In the theme of foodie films. And I love foodie films, so let's hear the other suggestions. What do folks have out there? So, <laughs> beautiful. So, Nick, mm -hmm. do you have a question? Do I have a question? Oh, that's a good point. Um, do we have questions? <laughs> this is another little thing on the on the podcast. Um, not too many questions coming in at the moment, um, mm. but uh, I think we still have a couple. So maybe recycling. Uh, you got one old one. I got one old one. Yeah. Recycle a question. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 put it up here. So maybe I'll ask you one here. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Um, here's one from maybe. Um, Veronica Scubin, can you explain what white martyrdom is? Where does our knowledge of its, of its definition come from? Okay, uh, well, white martyrdom as opposed to red martyrdom. Red martyrdom is the martyrdom of blood, the actual shedding of the blood for the gospel. That one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, red martyrdom, blood. <laughs> uh, white martyrdom is, is uh, understood as, as the daily sacrifices, the little deaths to self, those bloodless deaths to self. And I think white is, is important because it really is about a purification. Um, uh, maybe I can hint at a topic we were talking about. We were, we were, we were talking about the notion of chastisement. Mm -hmm. um, and the root of the word chastisement is to chasten, to make chaste, to mm -hmm. purify. Um, we tend to, to, to uh, uh, fall back sometimes in fear or... or uh, concern about the word chastisement or punishment or discipline, when in matter of fact, um, we recognize that this is about a purification mm -hmm. of the heart. So white martyrdom is about a purification 
through those little deaths to self so I can come to love God more purely, love my neighbor more purely, love myself more purely, um, letting things be stripped away. So, uh, in fact, much of our conversation today has been about what martyrdom. martyrdom. Yeah, I was just reflecting <laughs> little on that. Death itself, <laughs> which, no doubt, there's always going to be a little bit of fear and trepidation and anxiety involved, but it's the choices that we make of uh, grounding ourselves again in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. So white martyrdom, simply those, uh, the daily picking up your cross as a faithful disciple of Christ. Now, we have to be cautious to not fall into a martyr's complex. And I was sharing that with somebody the other day. So, but we spoke about that. I think that was uh, the staircase where it was like, get off the wood, or get off the cross. We need the wood. <laughs> we need the wood, yeah. yeah. So Beautiful where it's like, oh, I have to suffer. I have to suffer. It's like, no, no, no. Rejoice and be glad in a time of suffering. That's, that's what Jesus actually tells us to you, so... All right, I've got a question for you, and this isn't a foodie theme, all right? A little bit of a lighter, but a very important question. Okay, right? sure. So here it goes. This go is from, coming from Callista Nugent. Uh, Nick, what are your favorite quarantine snacks? <laughs> oh, gosh. And mo more importantly than that, I'm going to add this as a little rider to that question. So Callista asks, what are your favorite quarantine snacks? And I'm going to ask for a brief philosophic uh, description of why. <laughs> Why yes, I like but these it has quarantine to be snacks? It has to be philosophic. It has to be philosophic. Well, categorically, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, oh gosh, um, quarantine snacks. Well, I really enjoy nachos, and I just think that there's something about the um, about the gooiness of the cheese that really appeals to like the fluidity in our nature. And, uh, okay, that's just too much. I'm sorry, is gooey an actual philosophic term? That's what I'm wondering <laughs> yeah, at this point. It's gooey. It's right there beside um, um, imbecile or something like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, a philosophical thing. Well, like, if you look at the nacho, there is just something very geometrically perfect about the triangular, um, uh, you know, forms of those nacho chips. And Unless if you if you chips. If you're Pythagorean in your <laughs> philosophical school, you know, ancient Greeks, you know, like, I mean... Gooey you know, was Pythagoras' middle name, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pythagoras, Gooey, the Greek. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, All right. Well, <laughs> that's a, gets, let's, just, let's just put that to rest. Who gets the last word? But uh, nachos. Nachos. <laughs> sure. Yeah. There we go. Last word? Okay. Rock, Rock paper, paper, scissors. scissors. Oh. Rock, Rock, paper, scissors. scissors. All right, uh, I get the lost word. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in with us this week. Um, bit of a different podcast topic this week. Um, it's uh, Jim and I are just trying to be faithful little disciples along the little way of uh, St. Therese. And so we're going to continue doing these podcasts, and hope we're probably going to be changing up a few things with the structure from this point forward. Uh, more to come on that. We're still not sure. But thank you very much for tuning in. And um, if you like the show, please do send us a word um, on that. Because uh, if you can send us any suggestions about how to make it better, we will. We will make it better. This is, uh, you know, it is a bit misty at the moment um, for us kind of trying to go forward. But we're trying to do this in the service of the body of Christ. Um, other than that, yeah, just enjoy your day. God bless and uh, keep on the little way. Thank you.